Welcome everybody to today's talk. The topic of today, topic du jour for our presentation is uh, neutralizing today's cyber threats. Since it is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, uh, also happens to be Halloween month, uh, we're going to have a little fun with it today, give it a little bit of a, of a theme on uh, fighting the zombie apocalypse. So without further ado, we'll, we'll get going here. So our mission here at BlackBerry Silence is to protect every computer, user, and object under the sun. So if you are working with somebody from our team and you ask them what helps them get out of bed in the morning and what our purpose is, that, that's our purpose. We really try to protect you know, right now our, our client base and then hopefully um, down the road more and more folks as we go. Quick safe harbor slide, uh, the information presented in here is proprietary to BlackBerry Silence. Uh, if anybody, I know that these uh, webinars are routinely posted up to our website. So if anybody's interested, uh, you can ask marketing. They will provide it to you at a later date. But anyway, a little bit about me and my background. Uh, my name is Sig Murphy. I'm the Senior Director of Consulting um, or Professional Services here at BlackBerry Silence. I've been in my role uh, over two years now here, but I've been in cybersecurity, uh, mostly in the incident response space for almost 25 years now. It's a little scary to think about at this point, but I started doing uh, cybersecurity and, and uh, really started on the incident response side at the Department of Defense. And I was a defense contractor for 12 years right out of school. I served, I had the, the privilege to serve in a few roles at the, at the DOD Cyber Crime Center that are traditionally reserved for government employees. Um, due to staffing and other reasons. The, the first role, which is pertinent today, uh, is I was the, the first section chief for the intrusion and information assurance team. So basically the team that was tasked with helping all of our armed services um, branches fight cyber intrusions. And uh, I also am, feel very blessed um, in that my team was one of the first teams in the government to notice that there were coordinated attacks occurring um, from foreign governments into the U.S. Armed Services, uh, which later became known as uh, Advanced Persistent Threat Attacks. Um, I also spent some time at the counterintelligence, counterterrorism team there at DC-3 post 9-11 and spent great years there working as a kind of liaison between commercial entities, commercial companies, and the U.S. government as it relates to intrusions. And in about 2006-2007 timeframe, I started to moonlight on nights and weekends, started to serve as the investigative lead for some, some very large-scale corporate intrusions. And this felt like I was, I was able to to make, make a difference in that role as well. In 2012, I transitioned full-time into that commercial incident response role. I can't talk about the vast majority of cases that I, I, I worked as a, as a lead or have led over the years, but a lot of them are, are intrusions that you've probably heard about or seen in the news. One that I can talk about is the TJX matter, which is TJ Maxx and Marshalls and the, the hack that did occur back in 2006, 2007 over the Christmas holiday. The reason I can talk about that is because the attacker on that one uh, during his charging basically did a Scooby-Doo move and said, if it wasn't for those darn kids uh, on my team, uh, he would have gotten away with it. So it's public record out there that um, my old company and uh, our relationship there as we worked with law enforcement to close that one. Since joining Silence, I've been in charge of, and, and actually in my previous role as well, I've been in charge of not just incident response, but also proactive services. So I oversee all of our services here on the western uh, region for North America, as well as the TOLA region. So that, that includes things like compromise assessments, pen testing, you name it, things that, that we do for our clients to ensure that they have a better security posture and don't become a victim. I also oversee the incident response matters that we do. At any given time, we have a large number of, of IR cases going on here at BlackBerry Silence. We have one of the best teams in the world. We do have a worldwide team that can do round the, round the world respond. We are frequently, almost uh, universally doing worldwide response at any given time. So in that role, um, I often get to see kind of emerging threats and get firsthand knowledge of what, you know, what waves of cyber activity are, are coming in and uh, affecting people. And in particular, I get a first uh, 
you know, front seat view on new clients, clients that are not BlackBerry Silence technology clients that are getting hit by different strains of malware and ransomware. And so today we're going to talk about a few of those that are very prevalent these days and talk through what they are, how to counter them, and why they're, why they're such a, a problem. Uh, before we dig into that, I do have uh, and actively try and maintain a life outside of work. I do have a, a, a wonderful family uh, with some young young kids. I like to do lots of activities with them: hiking, scouting, uh, you know, venture guides. And uh, I also, in my spare time, when I have some, uh, when I'm not doing things like that, I uh, I also am a, a maker, uh, avid 3D printer and Raspberry Pi type Arduino type programmer. And I'm also a gamer when time allows, which is usually around the hours of uh, 5 to uh, to 5.45 in the morning, some mornings. But really appreciate Shirley asking me to talk uh, on this Halloween month. This month, beyond being a father and a gamer and a husband, I also, uh, I'm Batman. <laughs> so I actually gave an entire talk last year um, on Cybersecurity Awareness Month in costume as Batman. You can't see me right now. I'm not wearing my mask. Wanted to uh, to throw that out there, keep the spirit up. So today we're going to talk about current events. We're going to talk about some uh, recent attacks that have affected municipalities and, and governments around the world. We're going to talk about uh, one particular threat, which uh, is Saad and Okabe. This is one that I gave a previous talk on. It's still out there, still doing a lot of damage, but lately we've seen a resurgence of TrickBot. So since it's Halloween, we're going to talk about TrickBot or Treat and talk through what TrickBot is, why it's so vexing to uh, the, the traditional AV industry, and talk through how Silence can, you know, technologies can help combat that. We're going to do a threat demo. This is going to be not a live demo, but a recorded demo related to TrickBot and one of the loading mechanisms that, that's out there. Then we're going to do some question and answers. Uh, we're going to talk through basically uh, how you can protect yourself and then do the question and answer session. So lots of ground to cover today. Let's jump right in. So many of you have probably heard that there's been a lot of recent attacks that have taken um, city, state, and local governments offline. These are most uh, commonly ransomware attacks that have been effective in, in uh, encrypting up public systems. Uh, we also have quite a few instances. TrickBot in particular is being used by uh, not only organized crime, which is clearly becoming a pattern here, but also by nation state governments who have kind of co-opted it and can use it for other means. Uh, we'll talk through the payload of TrickBot and, and why that would be interesting to those governments a little bit later. Suffice to say that both of these strands of malware, both of these families of malware are out there and are having a large impact on lots of organizations, be they companies or local governments that are currently battling them. We are commonly getting new clients in, uh, clients that are, that are not uh, current customers of, of Silence, that don't have Silence Protect and Optics installed, that are getting hit with some of these variants. And we do have playbooks for these and other variants as far as how we can, uh, we can get them protected. But I will tell you right, right now, before we dig into the details, especially with something as, as virulent as TrickBot, it's not easy. And usually by the time that we get called in, a lot of times the, uh, the infection has run throughout the environment and through the, the attempted spread is really causing a lot of disruption. Uh, that is definitely a challenge. Let's start with uh, Sada Nokibi. So this one's very interesting. I'm not going to spend as much time as, as I have on you know, previous talks that I've given on this, but this was interesting because Back in, I would say, late last year, early this year, there was a, a variant of this family of, of malware called GANCRAB that was running around and causing a lot of damage. It's a type of ransomware. It is a ransomware as a service, which means that the authors of GANCRAB will sell their malware, they'll sell their ransomware to interested parties that can then use it and they can provide a cut of any ransom that they get back to the authors. Um, this is a business model that, that worked pretty well for them. 
Uh, it has a number of delivery mechanisms, but uh, as we're going to see, a very common one throughout today's talk is going to be spear phishing. Interestingly enough, with GAN crab as well, uh, they also in, uh, had some actors that were using it that infected MSPs or managed service providers. And there was a lot of activity that was generated and uh, frankly, a lot of attention that was paid by, by uh, the news media on infections that were revolving around these MSPs. So basically, the attackers would, would get into an MSP infrastructure, and then they would utilize the remote access, the legitimate remote access that, that had been set up by the MSP to uh, work on behalf of their client. The, the attackers would utilize that and then would, would spread the, the ransomware. By May of this year, GANCRAB was responsible for over half of all infections. Uh, that's, that's pretty staggering if you think about how much we've all encountered ransomware, how much we've heard about it, and how big of a problem it is. By May, there were, according to the authors, there were about $2 billion worth of ransom paid, with about $150 million of that going to those authors who, remember, sold it as a service. Uh, they did something kind of interesting but in May. They, they basically, uh, right at the, the peak of their popularity, the, uh, the authors said, all right, guys, they posted into a number of dark web forums, kind of that, that hidden internet, um, for those of you that aren't familiar. Uh, they posted a notice saying, all right, everybody, it's been real. We're out of here. We're retiring. Um, here's how much we've made over the last year. And, uh, you know, we're going to all drink pina coladas and, and sit in the sand, right? So people were kind of scratching their heads as to, you know, something's working for these folks. Why are they leaving? Do they feel that there's heat on them? What's going on? Previously, and unbeknownst to a lot of folks, uh, the, the months leading up to uh, that May announcement, there was another variant of ransomware launch called Sada Nokibi. Saad Nokibi is basically a, a new and improved version of uh, GANCRAB. And it became very clear to researchers here at Silence as well as around the community, security, and specifically the AV community, that Saad Nokibi was a variant of GANCRAB. It was new and improved. It, did, uh, it used a new way to exploit. Uh, it's that CVE value right up there, the 2725 had some other ways of, of being spread, but of course, still spear phishing. And then it really took the crown going from uh, from May forward leading into the summer. It uh, was at one point so prevalent that we were, we were getting probably eight, nine, 10 new cases uh, a week, at least new, new folks reaching out for help. It was something that we could easily counter with our advanced and, and our next-gen AV and EDR tools, but a lot of the other kind of legacy AV vendors out there were having problems with this. So it held its crown pretty well until a few months ago. And in the summer of this year, we started seeing a resurgence of an old friend. So TrickBot is really interesting. And TrickBot has been around for a few years now. And we've seen a number of uh, iterations of it, evolutions, if you will, variants of it that have been released. And what's very interesting is that TrickBot is basically designed to be modular. It's designed to be delivered via another means if necessary or if desired. And so we've seen a real explosion of these kind of two-phase deliveries using TrickBots. Things like the smoke loader, uh, which we'll touch on later, is a, is a very common delivery variant. The Emotet, which is, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of as well, and I've, I've actually done a entire talks on Emotet. That was kind of the, the real hot threat last year. Uh, the Emotet authors got smart last year and they, they decided to, to start selling Emotet as a delivery mechanism for other malware. So they basically transitioned from doing their own delivery. It was very interesting because they, uh, they, they picked targets very well. They, they kind of did some dry runs against financial sectors around the world and kind of would do testing on, on one financial sector, then would disappear for almost a year, come back, 
hit another one. So they, they started in Central Europe, then they disappeared, then they came back and they hit the UK, and then they disappeared again. And then they came back and they hit the US financial sector. They, they then disappeared one last time, and then they, they reemerged uh, as a ransomware as a service provider. And one of the most, I'd say, formidable pairings of ransomware is Emotet as a delivery mechanism and TrickBot as the spread or as the payload. TrickBot, if, if it's coming in itself, it basically will utilize weaponized uh, Word and Excel or, or other Office document files. And we'll see, we'll see more of this in the demo, but it's designed in such a way to trick users to uh, enable macros and then to run kind of badness on their, on their system. That drops the downloader, and then the malware is generally downloaded into a common directory. It will do a number of things once it gets on the system. One of the, the common things it will do is it will turn off Windows Defender, it will turn off other, other AV, and then it will spread itself very effectively using local admin shares and using some other persistence mechanisms. It actually has three different ways to spread. It is so effective that uh, we, we were getting calls when this was kind of that, that first wave late last year. We were getting calls all the time where clients were getting taken offline by this, by this Emotet TrickBot combo. They were uh, so effective at getting it in and then it, the spread code was so effective that in effect, the spread itself was denial of servicing a lot of companies to the point where they couldn't operate. If you're a, uh, if you're a, a virus, you know, a ransomware as a service author, that's suboptimal because you, you actually want the spread to occur and then for it to do whatever it's designed to do versus being so noisy and so painful that right away folks are, are taken offline. So we actually saw a, a dip as GAN Crab and SOD took over. Then this last, I would say, late spring into summer, we started seeing what appeared to be new variants of TrickBot that were a lot smarter and were being deployed in a lot smarter ways by the attackers. The attackers were, in some instances, doing rather than this automated deployment method where they just kind of get in via spear phishing, it automatically spreads and does its badness, and then they get, they get the harvest, and then they ransom up stuff. We were seeing a little bit more thought and kind of deliberate actions being undertaken by those attackers. That, that was a little bit of a shift. And our team at BlackBerry Science Threat Research and Threat Guidance, as well as a lot of the other teams out there, were doing some research onto this, these new variants. And basically, uh, there's some pretty strong indications that uh, it's tied to potentially organized crime in different parts of the world. And that's interesting because uh, it, it's definitely a marked sea change for, the, for the, this type of, uh, of malware but also because of what it's doing. So it is modular, as I mentioned before, and whether it's being delivered via smoke loader or Emotet, uh, one of the main modules is a banking information stealer, can also load a number of other modules. There's ransomware type modules, there's um, C2 modules, there's, um, there's other things that makes it kind of tough to really fight effectively. Basically, it, it also, as, as is mentioned there on kind of that last bullet, the spread of these new variants is still pretty aggressive and has some automated components. Now, why is this really problematic for, the, for kind of the industry? One of the main features of, of TrickBot is, and then especially on the new versions, is that it's polymorphic in nature. What that means is that when you are infected with the variant, it's constantly changing as it's infecting your environment. So the variant that you have may or may not be seen anywhere else on the internet, anywhere else in a corporate environment. We've seen a number of different variants every day that pop up. And so for traditional AV, which is signature based, that's an impossible problem. 
because nobody's really seen the thing that's hitting you. So how do you build a signature around it to, pr to protect against it? Silence Protect being uh, the you know, next gen ML enabled AV that it is, it actually doesn't need a signature. It can basically detect, it, it will do a, an analysis on the component parts of the TrickBot executable and say, this is bad. And that's because of the way that we built Silence Protect. So it's effective where, where other folks um, are not. That being said, we, you, there were variants of TrickBot that were, that were really hard to, to tackle and required our, our second tool, which is Silence Optics, to effectively curtail it, especially that spread functionality, uh, and to get ahead of that. Our TR, Threat Research Team, just yesterday released an update that should even more effectively tackle that polymorphic variance between the, the different trick bot executables. So if we take a step back, we, we talked about this and just touched on it briefly with the difference between kind of traditional and next-gen AV. But if we take a step back and we look at some of the, the super large incidents that have occurred in the last you know, few years or so, <laughs> there's a reason that, that they, they are effective. Uh, WannaCry, for those of you that, that dealt with that and had to live through it, that was a wake-up call for a lot of folks. It was using a you know, NSA developed exploit that uh, was, was published and released through, through that leak called Eternal Blue, for those of you that are uh, knowledgeable about that. But um, it, it caused billions of dollars worth of damage. And this was shortly eclipsed by NotPetya, which also was, was basically built into kind of a, an automated delivery model using some of that same type and same caliber of, uh, of exploit uh, that, that WannaCry is built on. And this was multiple billions of dollars worth of damage. And there's a lot of stories out there where folks were taken completely offline or large portions of their businesses were taken completely offline by this. There's a great Wired article about Maersk out there, how the, the shipping international shipping giant was effectively brought to its knees for a number of days. Um, there's other articles out there about FedEx and Merck. These are all large multinational corporations that were, in effect, brought offline by this particular piece of ransomware or of, of malware. And there were a number of new clients that we were able to, to work with and to serve throughout both of these. And we were instrumental in limiting the damage for a lot of these new clients. We had one new client where we had done a, a demo on the Friday before WannaCry hit and that we were uh, front of mind, I guess. And then it hit that next, you know, that next week and they were starting to uh, be taken offline. Traditional AV, if you all remember, was completely ineffective at first. Not our, our approach. Our approach using that machine learning model where we don't have to have a signature, where the, the model on agent can determine legitimacy or badness right there uh, without having to be updated every single, you know, multiple times a day, um, was very effective at stopping both of these and helping out our clients. So pretty staggering. Uh, we, we, we live in an ex extraordinary times. I, I did a, what, what I thought was a really fun talk a few years back about just the predicament that we've put ourselves in. As folks have rushed to put everything online and as companies wanted to, to establish and maintain a, a competitive advantage by rushing to put everything online, we, a lot of times, unbeknownst to ourselves, created a, a huge expansion of our, our security surface area and our risk. And it's become more and more prevalent. I'm probably speaking to the, there's preaching to the choir here as folks are dealing with this day in and day out, but this is staggering. We're not too far away from 2021. And it's the, the statistics out there 
are stating that, that cybercrime damages are going to cost the world $6 trillion by 2021, up from, it's doubling from 2015. This is the greatest transfer of economic wealth in history and is more profitable than the global trade of all major illegal drugs and even all of counterfeiting combined. That is a staggering, staggering statistic, folks. So all of these other traditional, conventional methods of generating illicit money, illicit funds, are going to be completely dwarfed by cybercrime in just two short years. That's crazy, but that's the world that we're living in. Furthering on that, the average cost of cybersecurity is now over one trillion dollars a year, versus you know, and averting cyber cyber disasters is over one trillion dollars a year, versus roughly three hundred billion in 2017 lost to all natural disasters in that year. So again, this is a, a serious escalation and uh, almost exponential growth here of cyber damages versus traditional. Some more fun facts for you. These have uh, changed a little bit uh, in the last year, and some of some of these statistics are were shocking to me when I when I read them. This is from uh, CSO Online, but cyber crime costs are going to double. We we talked we talked through that uh, ransomware costs, which is what we're talking about today. A lot of these uh, these malware variants are up 15 times since 2015, and will be 11 billion by the end of this year four times increased by the end of next year. Why is that happening? Because it's working. Because the bad guys can get money in this fashion, it's working. And we're gonna talk through the reason it's working and the reasons, I, t I hit on it a little bit earlier, spear phishing takes advantage of one of the most commonly vulnerable areas in cybersecurity, and that's your user base. That's really, really hard to combat. We do offer spear phishing services, and that's something we work with our clients to counter that behavior of the users just saying, hey, got an interesting email. I'm going to click on it. Oh, it says enable macros. I'm going to click on it again. That is really hard to counter when folks are trying to do their job and earnestly trying to do their job. We have one client that is a, I'd say, a very large real estate client that you know, the average for email spear phishing, statistically speaking, says that about 23%, if we do a campaign against a company to test who's going to click on these, about 23% of users will click on the emails and will be infected. That's crazy. We have a, a, a very large client that wants to get that down to 3%. So we're working with them on increasing their security posture in different ways to do that. That's a, a large challenge, but we're, we're making some serious headway there. This is another confounding factor. So human attack surface is going to go from 3.8 billion people to 6 billion people in 2022. This is as people come online, as the, the age demographic shifts, and as new folks in, in different countries and other parts of the world are getting access to, uh, to basically online devices and the internet, it's going to almost double by 2022 from where it is right now. Uh, this one's one of my favorite. Uh, <laughs> of course, we are, um, uh, you know, unfortunately in a growth industry. Our unfilled cyber jobs are, are going to triple from 1.3 million right now to 3.5 million in 2021. That's a crazy increase. And that's why we're seeing such a a, a challenge for a lot of companies out there that are trying to fill these skilled roles. Here at, uh, in, the, in the professional services team at BlackBerry Silence, we just grew pretty significantly again. We're, we're up to about 165 folks. And of those 165 folks, almost 70 of them are in our, what we call our strategic services team. And that's the team that we do staff augmentation services with. So basically, the folks that are assigned to our clients on usually a yearly basis to help them overcome their cyber challenges because there's so many jobs available out there 
that there are there's more there's there's far far more jobs than there are skilled people out there. So uh, we've been able to uh, retain some top talent in the area due to some of our advantages and and our technologies. Um, and and that's really really a place where we're seeing a giant giant growth here in this last really the last two years or so. And then spending wise. Is going to go. So you saw the damages um, up at the top. The spending is going to go to one trillion. So uh, still quite a different uh, ratio out there. <laughs> if if our damages are going to be six trillion and the spending is going to be one trillion by 2021, maybe maybe uh, we need to rethink that a little bit. But um, that's where we're at these days. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and switch to our demo. And this is a demo created by our threat research team. And what we're going to show is Dylance in operation against Smoke Loader and TrickBot. And we talked through TrickBot pretty extensively. We talked that it's, it's a uh, usually second phase infection, usually dropped by something like Emotet or Smoke Loader, something like that. So this is representative of an environment would see with Silence enabled with those threats. As with many of today's threats, Smoke Loader and TrickBot get into our networks through malicious email campaigns. In this example, we're going to start in the email with a normal looking email that contains an attachment. Download the attachment and open it just as a normal user would. A telltale sign for Smoke Loader is the fake error message that attempts to trick the user into thinking that enabling editing and enabling macros is normal for this document. Immediately upon enabling macros, we see Silence Protect stepping in and preventing the malicious script from executing. This stops the embedded scripts from downloading further stages of malware and infecting the system. After closing the document, we can look at the local Silence Protect console and view the events that have happened. You can see here the malicious script from the document being blocked. But what would happen if we disabled Silence Protect's script control feature? We do that by going into our console locating our computer and changing its policy to one that disables script control. This time, we actually want to let the script execute and see what happens next. Going back to the computer, we make sure that our policy is updated, and then we do exactly the same steps again. Download and open the attachment, ignore the warnings, just as normal users do every day, and immediately we see all sorts of things begin to happen. We begin to see Silence Optics pop-ups telling us that it has prevented a security issue and advises us to contact our Security Operations Center. We have multiple events, and also we see that Word has been automatically closed in the background. Switching over to the Silence console, we can easily review these Silence Optics detections. Not only did Silence Optics detect and prevent the attack from succeeding, but it also captured and stored all of the commands that were being attempted for further investigation and root cause analysis. We can examine the details of the first detection for evidence and responses. In this demonstration, we've configured Silence Optics to automatically respond by terminating offending processes. And here, we can not only see the commands being attempted, but we also can verify that the processes were successfully terminated. This is why Microsoft Word closed in the background. Lastly, we want to see what would happen had we allowed the scripts to run and actually download the next stage of the attack. We take a couple of samples that get downloaded in later stages of the attack and copy them to the desktop. We see that Silence Protect inspects the newly added file and quarantines it in the background. The second sample we try to execute manually. Again, the file is immediately quarantined. Smoke Loader is a great example of an attack that we see every single day. And in this demonstration, we see how Silence's technology and prevention first strategy keep computers safe. We saw a lot of different components to uh, the protection models built into Silence. We're going to talk through what happened there, and in particular, the, the various places where we you know, acted on that kill chain for smoke loader and then trick bot and why it was effective at stopping it. 
Um, I will say that we, we constantly are, are working with new clients that are getting hit with TrickBot. We also um, have some clients that uh, we, you know, we were in the process of working with them on a threat zero, you know, white glove implementation, or for business purposes, they've chosen not to turn on all the features of protect and optics, or they're in the process of doing so. And then they get hit with something virulent like TrickBot and uh, certain parts that are not fully protected with that script control per se uh, is a really good example might be affected, but it's it's localized to the systems that don't have everything turned on. What do we do here? So we talked about, uh, we, you just, just saw silence protected optics and traditional AV clients that come through the door that are hit with, with TrickBot commonly have traditional AV, other, other vendors out there that are not next gen, not AI, not ML uh, enabled, and they're doing that, um, that signature based detection and conviction. Because of our technology, what you just saw there, you saw the machine learning models in action effectively countering that type of threat. So let's talk through that and unpack it just a little bit. We just saw basically that, that kill chain, and it, it does, as new threats are brought to bear every single day, it changes. There are ways that you can predict the payloads and basically the malicious files, and that's what we did here. Let's unpack AI. So everybody back in 2012 when Silence launched, before it was Black Bear Silence, there was a lot of folks that went to to Black Hat. We, we had a small booth, and we were kind of the new player on the on the block. We said we are going to use math to effectively counter threats that are that are found out there in the wild. And all of the traditional AV vendors kind of laughed at our team. There were a lot of folks that um, that came from other AV providers. Uh, they had a lot of colleagues that were still at those AV providers and. The traditional thinking on those traditional providers was that, that artificial intelligence couldn't work, that threats were happening so fast that there was no way to get ahead of them besides the traditional uh, signature-based model. So what is artificial intelligence and how does it work when, it, when it's applied to an antivirus next-gen AV killer? For those of you that have Netflix at home, you have worked with artificial intelligence. Netflix predictive AI is so effective, basically you don't even have to use a, a, the star rating system to get something that's going to be interesting to you. Netflix looks at your viewing habits on what you viewed, how much time you spent on each program, and other programs that, that you've uh, viewed but not actually watched, so you've kind of like been interested in. And it uses artificial intelligence to then predict what shows are going to be you know, hits for you and you alone. So what, what's interesting to you? Netflix found that customers on average give up 90 seconds after they, they start searching for a movie uh, before they, they enacted this. So by improving their search results, Netflix was able to, uh, to avoid their canceled subscriptions enough to prevent $1 billion of losses every year because they know that they have the content that you really want to see and they use AI to bring it to you. So you have used AI, it, it is present in your life. Let's talk about predictive advantage for a second. If we are looking at, at time as it were a spear, uh, starting from the left of the screen to the right, as both time and spears tend to do, moving from the left to the right, if you were to look at your watch right now and think back to your network environment, there are only two types of threats on it right now, unknown and known. The unknown is the tip of the spear. So what, what we've tried to do here in the last 10 years uh, is to deal with the unknown tip of the spear using detonation chambers, C2 detection, big data, cyber threat intelligence, we, we've tried to proactively hunt for threats in our environment that have already gained a foothold in memory. But what Silence has done is we've leveraged a ground up, truly predictive AI engine that's ahead of the entire sphere altogether, both for unknown and known threats. 
this kind of provides you a cushion in the temporal sense. You can see up there, the approach in the old days was basically a defense in depth approach with antivirus, firewalls, air gas, web proxies, you name it. And then for unknown threats, you had all those things that I mentioned earlier, the detonation chambers, callback detection analytics, and uh, cyber threat intelligence. We bypass all of that. To put it very simply, threat actors have had a time advantage over us for years, and we've been playing catch up for decades, but not anymore. So what you see on your screen, I love this slide. Sometimes it's a little bit confusing. This is what we call our, our temporal predictive AI time advantage. And this is uh, the number of months where the silence engine on agent, on computers, uh, it's the number of months prior to the threat being introduced into the wild that the agent would have detected and convicted it. So it's a little bit hard. Let me, let me go back and I'll try and approach it from a different, different perspective. Because Silence is non-signature based, it's AI enabled, it's a machine learning module or a series of machine learning modules, it doesn't have to be updated except on average about twice a year. It's not getting updates every day like most traditional ADs. We just tweak the model a little bit and we've gotten it to a level of maturity where we've got machines teaching machines. So it's, it's uh, I could do a whole speech on AI theory, but it's the most advanced out there right now. If a machine that had, that had Silence Protect installed on it, that hadn't been updated for 19 months before WannaCry hit, so the bottom line, it would still have convicted WannaCry and not let it run. So that's why all of our clients that were running Silence Protect were in effect inoculated against threats like WannaCry when it hit. And that's why we, we had these new relationships where we had the opportunity to serve new clients that didn't have Protect when nothing else was working out there. So let's take a look at WannaCry a little bit, little bit deeper. In November of 2015, Microsoft Windows became vulnerable to Eternal Blue. About 1.5 years later, Microsoft puts out a patch. Not everybody updates. So this was one of those where um, I don't think folks understood the threat that was facing them, basically, frankly, the world at that point. Then in April, uh, the Shadow Brokers um, published that treasure trove of NSA attacks, basically um, with, with exploits and, and malware samples and things like that were developed at the NSA. And included in that was exploit code for Eternal Blue, which is the vulnerability. Then in May, just a short month later, WannaCry was released and propagates, and it hit everybody hard. So in May of 2017, healthcare, government, logistics, you, we saw lots of examples of that earlier. I know I lived it. My colleagues have lived it. Lived it. It, was, uh, it was a challenging day, to say the least, for a lot of folks. That day, later that day, very late, um, traditional AV vend vendors started to issue signatures and patching, and they were uh, limitedly effective. We'll just put it that way. Three days later, they are still trying to patch. Basically, are having trouble doing it. Basically, can't patch around all the variants because they are signature-based. With AI, in November 2015, Silence released, the, so the same, same exact month, Silence released a new model, and all the clients with that model or future models were protected. Those two years go by, and guess what? Everybody is still protected. We've talked about a couple of variants of malware. Um, let's look at Sodnokabi. Here come our here come our zombies, and then here comes Silence to scare them away. So we had a temporal predictive advantage on Sodnokabi of 1,200 days from the time that it, it hit the the market. We were pre preventing it and convicting it 1,238 days before that day. It took the industry and quite a few thousand plus days to actually catch up because the threat uh, hadn't been widespread. And so we had a, a predictive advantage over the traditional AV industry of uh, over 1,100 days for SOD, which was um, very useful to our clients to say the least, as that was kind of the, the attack du jour when I talked about it for that time frame. 
let's talk about our, our VIP here today, TrickBot. Silence had a basically a temporal advantage of 1,302 days for, uh, obviously, TrickBot is, is polymorphic, but this is very common. I took a kind of an average sample and, and fed it in. Very common to what we see in with other variants as well. And um, because TrickBot was released into the wild, uh, there were some signatures. This bottom line that talks through the industry awareness is the first signature that was released for that variant. So even with that variant, there was a 744 day advantage. So you're talking pretty significant advantage at that point. And I think that's over, over two years if my math is correct. So again, we have, uh, this was the attack du jour twice. We saw it at the end of last year being delivered by Emotet. And then we saw um, this year, more recently, we saw it kind of taking the crown from, from Saad and from others being delivered by Emotet and other loaders like Smoke Loader as well. With that, um, you can see the power of that temporal advantage and why the technology is so effective. I will transition. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and see if there's any questions and answers from the group. Great question. For, uh, so there is a question. Um, do you have to be a product client to get instant response help from your team? No. Uh, you don't. We actually do take, it's our, our pleasure to, to serve any client out there that, that needs our help. We, you don't have to be a Protect or Optics client to get our help. We do have a couple of ways to, um, to, to start that relationship. And one of the best ways to uh, get instant response help when you need it is to set up an instant response retainer with us. I don't have enough time here to talk to get on my, my fully jump up on my soapbox, but the average cost of a cyber incident this year is over, believe it or not, is over $3 million. And that's according to um, IBM Ponemon study. And one of the largest ways to reduce that cost by over $300,000 uh, per incident is to have an established IR team and or an established team on retainer for an external party. So highly recommend that folks, uh, if you don't have a retainer, please talk to us and we'd be happy to do that. Um, there's some general emails on, on our website. You can talk to, you know, you can hit sales at silence.com. Uh, if, if you have any questions, you can talk to your sales rep if you do know who they are. But uh, what that allows us to do, the retainer allows us to give a bucket of hours. So we, we basically, the, your company would pre-purchase a bucket of hours at a discounted rate. The last place you ever want to be is in the middle of an incident without a company to help you uh, and, and paying street rates for IR. Uh, but if you don't need it during the term of that agreement, then you can utilize that for any of our other services. So you can do um, pen penetration testing, you can do a gap assessment, you can do uh, a compromise assessment, things like that. So that's one of our most popular uh, service offerings and for good reason. We have, I, I would say, we have a, a fair amount of clients out there that have a retainer with us but haven't been, you know, gotten Protect and Optics and we are happy to help anybody in that, in that role as well. Okay. And the question is, uh, what is the primary focus, detection, prevention, or both? That's a great question. So um, we believe that, that prevention is not only possible, it's provable with Silence technology, so Silence Protect and Optics in place. We strive to help our clients get to a preventative state, and we actually, that is why we call our white glove service offering Threat Zero. That is an objective-based engagement where the company, uh, if you purchase Threat, Threat Zero, uh, they will come in and they will customize the implementation of our technology to your environment. They will do their utmost um, to accomplish all of your goals and make sure that you are basically able to operate fully even with your environment locked down with script control turned on, memory protection turned on, and our uh, of course, our automatic quarantine of the unknown, unknown malware turned on as well. So that, that's where we like our, our clients to be. 
we also believe that detection is is important as well. And so the question as well in chat is, does, does script control block all macros or just bad ones? By default, it, you know, it is fairly heavy handed in that it will block most that could be bad. What we do is we actually, that Threat Zero team, they will blacklist pretty heavily and then they will then work with you to whitelist the ones that you need to operate. And that's what we found is the most effective approach there because it, you know, we will even go so far as to, uh, if you need to, to run PowerShell, oftentimes we will work with you to custom spin a version of PowerShell that's whitelisted that your team can use, that type of thing. So it's, I think works really well. Um, and with that, I think we're at the top of the hour. I do want to say thank you to everybody that attended today. Really appreciate everybody's time. If anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is smurphy, S-M-U-R-P-H-Y, at silence.com. And I'm happy to answer any, any questions. Do appreciate that, that you took the time to, to, to talk today. And I hope you have a great rest of your, not only Cybersecurity Awareness Month, but also your Halloween month as well. Thank you, everybody.